please welcome GlaxoSmithKline Chairman of Vaccines, Monsef Slawi, and CNBC's Meg Terrell. Yeah. They were just, they were so amazing. We were sitting with them over there and I had no idea how awesome they were, so that was so cool. Um, Dr. Slawi is the global chairman of vaccines at GlaxoSmithKline and uh, we're going to talk today about biopreparedness, just how to be better prepared for the next Ebola, the next Zika, because inevitably there will be one. And just to give you guys a hint about uh, the kind of guy Monsef is, uh, every time I'm with him, I learn something awesome about him or about the world or about science. And today it was when Vice President Biden was speaking and he mentioned the HPV vaccine. And Monsef very modestly leans over and he says, I discovered that. So. <laughs> So that's Monsef. Um, let's start by talking about um, Ebola, because two years ago, it was any, the only thing we could talk about. Um, and, and what's happened with vaccines there? So first of all, thanks for having me here. And, and uh, you know, if there is, there is one message I want to tell you. Remember the sense of urgency that Vice President Joe Biden instilled in us with uh, uh, the need to fight cancer, infectious disease, and in particular, epidemic infectious disease and pandemics can unfortunately have a dramatic impact on the human population in days. Uh, unfortunately, kill as many people as die from cancer in a year. So it's really, really very important. And Ebola was unfortunately not the last. Since then, there has been two more outbreaks. It was a very significant outbreak uh, that has really uh, raised to the attention of, of, of the global uh, community uh, because of, of, of the fear of, of these uh, infectious agents and, and the deaths associated with it. And in August of 2014, when the World Health Organization frankly called various companies, including GlaxoSmithKline, saying, do you have a vaccine against Ebola? We need help. This is a major uh, emergency. We, we, we looked and we said, yes, we have one. However, it's just in what's called preclinical stages, i.e. tested in animal models. And they said, well, we need to do something. And uh, we let go everything we, had, we were doing and dedicated all our resources to take this vaccine through. And in seven months, between August of 2014 and early January of 2015, we went from having experiments done in animals to starting a large phase three trial in Liberia. Now, it's so, which, which is things we do normally in seven or 10 years, not because we're lazy, because it's enormously complex, because there are so many stakeholders and regulations and, and rules that you have to go through. And also, we did it very fast because we were using a technology in which we had the confidence, we and the regulator had the confidence it would be safe and it would be effective. And long story short, by the time, incredibly fast time, seven months, instead of 10 years. It took us to start the phase three trial. Fortunately for the population in Liberia, the uh, outbreak subsided and we couldn't show whether this vaccine was effective or not. So even when we let go everything, we were too late. And imagine that these outbreaks were to spread through, were to effectively become global, and they could. The flu pandemic, which happened in 2008, 2009, has become global. And we were very fortunate as a population that it wasn't a deadly virus like the uh, Spanish outbreak was in the early 1900s. We were too late. Every time there, was, there is a pandemic or an outbreak, we've been too late. SARS, flu, MERS, Zika, Ebola, there will be outbreaks more and more. It's globalization. It's population moving. It's millions of people traveling every day on airplanes and on boats and by car. It's here to stay with us. We cannot continue to react all the time. So we've done a lot, but it wasn't enough. And this is really what drove us to make a new proposal. I want to talk about the new proposal, but I really feel like the, the differing tempos between infectious disease and science is a huge problem. So we see what happened with Ebola, where you went as fast as you possibly could, but because we started when Ebola was a problem, we couldn't catch up to it. And now 
we have your phase three Ebola vaccine and some others, are you confident that if and when Ebola comes back, they'll be able to help? Those would be, but I need to be clear, there are at least three strains of Ebola virus. And the vaccines, the two vaccines that have been made available now, only protect against one strain. And we have no idea what other strain of Ebola may come out, or another virus with an exotic name that we have never heard before, like, like Zika. Or there, and fortunately, there's a list of 77 outbreak agents from the CDC. And of those, there's 13 or 14 prioritized by the World Health Organization. We have no vaccine against these. Now, the good news, we could make vaccines against these. The challenge is only large vaccine companies that have the technologies needed to make vaccines not for an experimental clinical trial, but for millions or hundreds of millions of people. They have no incentive to, to, to invest their resources to make this vaccine because there's no market for them. In fact, the best thing that could happen to, pop, to the world is that there is no market for these vaccines. We have to find a way to use those capabilities, those technologies, those, that know-how that exists in large pharmaceutical companies, large vaccine companies, to the benefit of global health. And that's really the heart of the proposal we have. And so the proposal at GSK, just walk us through it in terms of establishing sort of a bio-preparedness organization. Yes. So the, the idea is very simple. It's better to be prepared than to react. And secondly, if you are to react, you better be super fast and not spend your time trying to decide how you're going to react. And the best way to do that is to have a dedicated, permanent organization that has access to the technologies that we have spent decades and billions of dollars, literally, to develop, to discover, to patent. Make those technologies available to that organization and ask that organization under the governance of an independent body, and I will come to that in a minute, to ask that organization to go through those diseases that threatens humanity and discover and develop vaccines against them, one after the other. And in, that's the preparedness part. And God forbid, if, if an outbreak happens with a disease that we haven't yet a vaccine against, that same organization can be instantly refocused it will be trained, geared, and has the technology to maybe rather than seven months, in four months, make a vaccine and make it available. What does a company like GlaxoSmithKline need in order to be able to divert a team of people to do that, from doing something that might be profitable, like a diabetes drug or a cancer yeah. drug or something, to do work like this? What do you need to do that? Yeah. So the, the, the challenge is the, what we call the opportunity cost, rather than discovering a vaccine against papillomavirus, HPV, or RSV, we, we, we diverted our resources to, to Ebola or to flu pandemic. The, the challenge is for the persistence of our organization. We have to be, provide a return to the shareholders. At the same time, we believe in GSK that for the persistence of our organization, we have to be socially responsible. We have things that only large organizations can do. We have to use them for the, for the good of humanity. So we proposed to make all our technologies available for free to an organization under our oversight that is governed by an independent body. We do not want to make any benefit from it. We do not want it to cost us. And we will have that organization take our technologies as they are today or the improvements we will make to them. And as I said, discover vaccines, develop them register them with the regulators. And as we made this proposal to various governments, at the same time, the WHO, various governments and ministries of health, various philanthropic organizations started to think through with the Ebola crisis, how can we do, how can we do better? And there's been a converging perspective from all these stakeholders to say, we have to do something together and we have to do it better. And we participated as industry and, and as GlaxoSmithKline in particular to the creation of a new coalition called CEPI or the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation. And actually the CEO of that coalition is here present in the room. 
And this coalition puts together philanthropic organizations, government agencies, and uh, in, 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 a, in a form of uh, a community regulatory agencies, vaccine industrial players, uh, civil society leaders, uh, in, a, in, a, in a constituency that is going to oversee which diseases should we make a vaccine against, that will raise funding and use it to provide support to an organization like the biopreparedness organization we have proposed, or to other forms through which companies that have technologies that can be useful can make them available to discover vaccine. This is such a big task, big task that we have to do it together and as many players as possible. Now, our stand is to say, here and now, here is a proposal. We put it out there for free. To be honest, it's been two years we talk about it. I can't imagine how we will all feel if, God forbid, tomorrow there is another outbreak and we're not prepared for it. We have to do it. And my, my ask to this audience, today, tomorrow, the next day, there are more than 150 leaders from across the world here. This is an issue that can change the face of humanity overnight. We have to deal with it. We have to be prepared. There is now a global organization called the CEPI that can oversee how industrial know-how and knowledge can be made available with no profit for the benefit of humanity to help us deal with this. We have to do it. And I'll count on you to, to really spread this message and create the same sense of urgency we have all felt as Joe Biden was talking about cancer for something that can touch us all anytime. We're out of time. Thank you, Dr. Slawi. Thank you.